What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Guiding Keys, the story of Kingdom Hearts presented by the Unlockables podcast. My name is Eric. I am your host, and I'd like to thank you, as always, for tuning in. Wherever, whenever, in time and space you might be located, it means a lot to me that you tune in to check out the show, see what we have to say, and in this case, listen to me talk about Kingdom Hearts for however many hours this episode's going to be. We're on to the next game in the Kingdom Hearts series, and of course, that next game up is... Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories and Rechain of Memories. We're going to be talking about both entries today and we'll talk about why there are both entries. We'll go over that a little bit. But before we get into that, if you haven't listened to parts one and two on Kingdom Hearts one, we recently covered those in the first couple of Guiding Keys episodes. I had to split those into two episodes just because they got pretty long and pretty unwieldy. Those episodes lay a pretty good base foundation for the knowledge that you'll probably need carrying forward in these episodes otherwise you're gonna have no idea what i'm talking about or maybe you just like the madness maybe you just like to hear me talk about the random Nomura insanity that this series has become which is totally fine but either way i highly recommend that you go check out the first two parts of kingdom hearts one to kind of get caught up figure out what's going on it they're apparently pretty good episodes i got a lot of good feedback on them they're two of my highest performing episodes i've ever put out for the podcast so i i'm very proud of them if you just go give them a listen you'll be ready for this one now moving on to chain of memories and rechain of memories let's just get a little bit of background information before i dive into these games and start giving you my thoughts and start connecting this game to kingdom hearts one and start loosening the plot threads going forward in the rest of the series so Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories was originally co-developed by Square Enix and Jupiter. It was published by Square Enix and Disney Interactive. It was released in Japan November 11th, 2004 and in North America December 7th, 2004. Just getting a little bit of the last relevant sales data, by 2009 the game had sold 1.55 million units worldwide. As of 2006, which is the last time there was like the, kind of this comparative sales data, uh, the original Kingdom Hearts had sold about 6 million units worldwide in its initial run release. This is right before Kingdom Hearts 2 or right around the time of Kingdom Hearts 2, uh, a little bit after Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. For comparison, the other big Square Enix game from this era, I would say is Final Fantasy X, uh, that had sold 8 million units. So for Chain of Memories on the GBA to sell 1.55 million units worldwide by its finished run it is pretty good for a handheld game on metacritic chain of memories for the gba is sitting at about a 76 game informer gave it a 7.75 out of 10 8 out of 10 on ign 36 out of 40 for famitsu and 3.5 out of 5 stars for game pro so pretty good numbers across the board there was another edition of this game there was a remake a 3d remake called re or re colon chain of memories and it was released on the ps2 it was developed by square enix's fifth product development division out of osaka it was released on the kingdom hearts 2 final mix plus in japan and as a standalone title in north america on december 2nd 2008 the reason for this being that originally after the original kingdom hearts games would come out japan would get a updated version with extra content called final mix versions so kingdom hearts 2 final mix plus was like the definitive version of that game and it had the rechain of memories completely remade in 3d on it and for whatever reason they decided to release this game in the states on december 2nd 2008 now for those of you that are good at video game history you will understand that this was two years after the playstation 3 had just launched so we got a game on the PlayStation 2 in 2008 when the PS3 was already in the wild. And that's not difficult to understand. I mean, the PS2 was an absolute monster when it came to shipping units. I mean, there was it's the highest selling console to date. I believe that they were even putting out games on the PS2 as late as the late 2010s. I believe one of the last games made for PS2 was what, like FIFA 14 or 15 or something like that. So, yeah, it, it might surprise you a little bit. Metacritic score for Rechain of Memories lower than the GBA one, 68. 6.75 out of 10 on Game Informer, 8.4 out of 10 IGN, 6.5 out of 10 for GameSpot, and 4.5 stars from GamePro.
this has been one that I've been waiting to talk about for a long time. I didn't play Chain of Memories on the Game Boy Advance right when it came out. I actually played Kingdom Hearts 1 and then went straight to Kingdom Hearts 2. And I played the Game Boy Advance version of Chain of Memories a few years later, which might surprise you because those of you that listen to the show know that the Game Boy Advance is probably one of my favorite consoles, if you can even call it a console, of all time. A lot of games on the Game Boy Advance are in my quote unquote top 10 games I've ever played, my GOAT list. Two of those being Advanced Wars 2 Black Hole Rising and Fire Emblem 7, just called Fire Emblem. So I have a lot of love for the Game Boy Advance. And you would think that my natural attraction to Kingdom Hearts would lead me to want to seek out and get this game. But no, I, I never really did, despite the fact that there was marketing around it and I knew of its existence. I just never really did. And I'm trying to think of if that was because I wasn't obsessed with Kingdom Hearts to the level that I am now. That might have come in Kingdom Hearts 2, but I just didn't get it. That being said, I have played both the Game Boy Advance version and recently was just the version I played for the show. Rechain of Memories, which was the 3D remake, which is the version that is included with all of the HD collections that they released throughout the 2010s. Just some real quick general thoughts and general background on this game before we dive into the good stuff. As it stands, Chain of Memories and Rechain of Memories, they're not only the most unique games in the entire series, but they're definitely also the most divisive for reasons that we'll cover, cover here in just a second. The, the first questionable decision is, you know, just imagine you're coming off of playing Kingdom Hearts 1, which was wildly successful, obviously successful enough that, you know, it set up a, a brand new franchise for, for Disney and Square Enix and pr prove that this weird partnership of Disney and Final Fantasy could work. And you're getting excited and you want to know about the next Kingdom Hearts title that's coming out. And the next one is going to be on the Game Boy Advance. And I just think that that's a really interesting decision to make despite the fact that when I get into a little bit of the development history you'll see why this decision was made but it's just very surprising that you would have such a huge blockbuster be, that'd be like them making Final Fantasy 7 and it being so successful and then the next Final Fantasy game they put was on the Game Boy and didn't go right to Final Fantasy 8. Interesting decision here and it's really started this trend of Kingdom Hearts games getting put on different consoles than just like your mainline consoles. And it really established the precedent going forward that the smaller, more intimate Kingdom Hearts games would be on these handhelds or would be on different different consoles. Chain of Memories was on the, the GBA. Birth by Sleep was on the PSP. 358 over two days was on the DS. Dream Drop Distance was on the 3DS. The mobile games were obviously on mobile. Only your major Kingdom Hearts titles at this time, the plan was like your Kingdom Hearts 1, your Kingdom Hearts 2, and your Kingdom Hearts 3. Only those more expansive games saw releases on consoles and these in-between games, which were still absolutely necessary for the understanding of the story, were put on these smaller handheld consoles. This is a very, very interesting decision. I think when you're looking back at the legacy of Chain of Memories and Rechain of Memories, I think there's consensus in the community, and I tend to agree with a little bit here. I do think that the GBA version of the game is a better version and is the more enjoyable version to experience. And I do think that a lot of people that experience Chain of Memories in the moment have a better opinion of the game than those that experience it afterwards. So if you were a fan of Kingdom Hearts from the first game and were waiting for a Kingdom Hearts 2, then obviously Chain of Memories was going to tide you over. And obviously you're going to have better memories of that game than looking back at it. Because I feel like in the moment, that was enough to tide Kingdom Hearts fans over until the next full title. The remake version, however, it, it, it merged the 3D world of Kingdom Hearts 1 with the mechanics of the GBA version to make it feel like a direct sequel to Kingdom Hearts 1, and I don't think they succeeded in this, which we'll get into when I talk about the gameplay, most notably talking about the game's infamous card battle system and the room synthesis. I think on a handheld title, something like the card mechanic and something like the room synthesis mechanic, which we'll talk about in just a minute, works incredibly well, and I think it makes for an interesting gameplay concept. But when you scale that up to 
full 3D and now instead of having to worry about a 2D plane, you're having to worry about a 3D space, it doesn't work as well. And I certainly found myself throughout my playthrough of Rechain of Memories, about halfway through, I was kind of getting sick of it. I was kind of, it was just very repetitive and very time consuming, having to clear rooms and do battles and clear rooms and do battles over and over and getting these story cutscenes, which is really what you're there for, sprinkled in between basically the floors of the castle. And I think it's a shame that the most widely available way to experience the story and gameplay of Chain of Memories is through the remake. They basically haven't done anything to preserve the GBA version at all. And like I said, I think the GBA version is very unique. The pixel artwork for the GBA version is is gorgeous. And something about that game, I just feel like the art and the music and everything that they did with it, it has a lot of heart in it. Whereas the 3D remake just feels very lifeless and very soulless by the time you get to the end of it. I think the cutscenes are still great, and I think it does a great job of filling out the lore of this world, but it just feels like a shell of itself compared to the Game Boy Advance version. So the fact that people coming to the series later can't experience the Game Boy Advance version the way the game was originally supposed to be experienced is is rough. And I'm disappointed that Square Enix hasn't made that game available to play in some form, some way to us. But when you're porting games to an HD collection on a major console, I can understand that porting it from the GBA may not just be possible. Still, it's available for emulation if you still want to experience it. The rechain of memories can be kind of difficult to get through. Or if you just really want to experience the story, you can watch the cutscene. I think there's about an hour and a half of cutscenes that involve Sora. So you can just watch that and get basically what you need from. Chain of Memories revisits a lot of the worlds from the first game, but I found that actually journeying through the worlds is more of the B-plot. When you get to the areas between the worlds, and essentially what's happening is you're in a location called Castle Oblivion, and Sora is reliving his memories of the worlds as he ascends the castle, and every time he goes up to a next floor, there's like an in-between space, and that's really where a majority of the story, a majority of the dialogue, a majority of the plot are advanced. So really, the stuff that happens in the world is just kind of like this B-plot that doesn't really mean anything. It's got some story exposition around the themes of the game, obviously, with it being called Chain of Memories. Obviously, it's going to explore these themes of what your memories are. Anything that is important for, like, lore-wise happens in between all of these Disney worlds. So I actually had a bit of a personal journey with this game when I started playing it in 2022 and 2023. I was in the latter camp that I described. I was a person that didn't play Chain of Memories right when it came out, and I went straight to Kingdom Hearts 2. While I enjoyed playing Chain of Memories on the GBA later, I never held the game in very high regard, and I was lukewarm on the card combat system. And I'd also never experienced Rechain of Memories. I never went back and experienced that because my perception of Chain of Memories as a whole left it lower on my list overall ranking of the Kingdom Hearts titles. Even after playing Rechain of Memories, I was still a little lukewarm on it. But as I started to sit down and compile my notes and seeing that this was the closest I'd ever played Chain of Memories to a playthrough of Kingdom Hearts 1, and this entire series will be the closest that I've ever played these titles in conjunction with each other, it gave me a bit of a different lens to kind of look at Chain of Memories with and look at the series as a whole. Now that Kingdom Hearts 3 was out and I kind of have the full picture of what the series was going for, I actually ended up regarding it better than I originally did. I think I appreciated the more intimate story setting of Chain of Memories, Rechain of Memories, which, like I said earlier, you're in a location called Castle Oblivion. That's where the whole story takes place. And so while you don't have to have this narrative of jetting around the multiverse to all these different worlds, it allows the game to tell a more focused story on character, on Sora, on the plot that's going on around him, on his search for Riku and King Mickey, and the things that are going around with this new evil villainous group called The Organization. You get an intimacy of the storytelling that you don't get in the major Kingdom Hearts games because the numbered Kingdom Hearts games are these fantastical, world-spanning adventures that have a lot that have to carry a lot more weight than a game like chain of memories i know this is probably going to sound crazy to a lot of people that 
look at the series from the outside looking in, but I also grew to appreciate Nomura as a storyteller more, more than I already appreciated him, which I had to have because I'm doing a series about this, the story of his games. Despite questionable marks on the execution of said story, the story he was trying to tell was consistent, even going so far back as Chain of Memories rechain of Memories. Seeing early iterations of all the new characters and knowing where they end up made me appreciate the job Nomura did in staying true to their characters while they grew through the series, and he, he did a fantastic job of this. Characters that are present here that are present through to the end of the series, you know, have this consistent uh, character arc and character growth and don't stray from the way they portray themselves. And one of the accusations that I've had against Kingdom Hearts in the past was I felt like Nomura had a plan in Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories 2, and maybe even 358 over two days. And that with Birth by Sleep, he was trying to fit the narrative of those early games into a later narrative that he came up with. But experiencing Rechain of Memories led me to realize that there were seeds of things that pay off years down the road that were planted even in this early GBA game. So Nomura always kind of had this lengthy roadmap of the story that he wanted to tell and the concepts that he wanted to communicate. And despite not pulling that off the best he possibly could have by having these games spread out over all these different consoles and with how I feel the finale was handled in Kingdom Hearts 3, which is obviously we'll get to that when we get to that. He had he knew what he wanted to tell and he knew he wanted to tell a story with the level of complexity in a Final Fantasy game like Sakaguchi told him that he had to do for the series to be successful. And he did just that. We'll start to kind of connect the thread lines throughout this podcast series so you can kind of see, hey, he'd been thinking about these things the whole time and maybe make it so that it's not so convoluted, which it's still going to be convoluted because even longtime series veterans, longtime people that have made content around Kingdom Hearts for so long still debate finer points of the lore of the series. One of the things I got for Christmas was the the Kingdom Hearts Ultimania, and it includes all the information from all the games from uh, Kingdom Hearts 1 all the way up until before Kingdom Hearts 3. And he writes a note in there, and I believe it says something to the effect that when he was making the games and when he would give the developers and the designers the story beats, he wouldn't tell the developers and the, the designers more than they needed to know because he wanted he didn't want them to accidentally give away story beats and story plot points that he wasn't ready to reveal yet. And he wanted to be able to give his... The, the people that love this game, a story and a game that they could speculate about and that they could talk about and they could engage with in conversation with one another about what certain points mean and what the next things are coming and what are these little tidbits that he sprinkled around and left clues for things that are coming in the future. If that was his main intention, he definitely succeeded because to this day, the Kingdom Hearts fan base is ravenous and they consume everything that he puts out and look for further meaning in it because he likes to see the community discuss and build this world alongside him. And whether or not that's been successful, I know it could be off-putting for a lot of people that don't have a tolerance of that sort of thing. But if this was his goal all along, he absolutely succeeded. And it's beginning to become evident as early as Chain of Memories. So I think that concludes my wrap-up thoughts about Chain of Memories and how you can expect my mindset to be for this episode going forward. But before we go any further than that, let's really dig down and touch on the development history of Chain of Memories. Just imagine, Kingdom Hearts 1 had been released in the United States in the fall of 2002, and by April 2003 had sold its millionth copy in North America. Meanwhile, the game had already crossed that threshold in Japan and had maintained its popularity throughout the year, winning serious praise at the end of year celebrations by many video game publications. If you're Kingdom Hearts creator and director Tetsuya Nomura, you're elated. Somehow, someway, this strange game had managed to fuse elements of Disney and Final Fantasy into a cohesive, fun, and exciting experience that had created a brand new series for developer Squaresoft, and a ton of new fans all over the world. So of course, there was never any question that a sequel would be in order. But before any work began on a potential Kingdom Hearts sequel, Square would be radically transformed into the company that we are more familiar with today.
In April 2003, the same year that Kingdom Hearts reached its 1 million milestone in North America, Square and Enix completed their merger. The legendary publisher of the Dragon Quest series and the creators of Final Fantasy were now working together. Enix as a business entity remained, while Square Co. Limited was dissolved and the new business took on the familiar name of Square Enix. The merger had been in the works since at least 2000, but the commercial disaster that was Final Fantasy The Spirits Within left Square struggling financially, leaving Enix reluctant to commit to the deal while Square was bleeding money. But with the monumental success of Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts, Square was able to quickly recover and the merger went on as planned. On April 1st, 2003, Square Enix as an entity came into being and began operating. Many former Square and Enix employees made the transition, including Nomura, who had already begun planning ideas for his Kingdom Hearts sequel. Originally, Nomura had intended to begin work on a direct sequel to Kingdom Hearts to release on the PlayStation 2. But as he started to build out the story and the universe of the series, he concluded that there might be room for an intermediary game between the two titles. He had originally planned for the aptly named Kingdom Hearts 2 to be set a year after the original, and realized there was potential to flush out the story even more with the game set in the time between Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2. When an idea was floated for that game to appear on Nintendo's new Game Boy Advance, he was skeptical. Despite the fact that the GBA was a commercial success and was guaranteed to sell copies based on the strength of Kingdom Hearts name alone, Nomura wasn't sure that the 3D graphics and gameplay established in the first game would translate in a meaningful way to 2D, a change that was necessary given how much less power the GBA had compared to the PlayStation 2. But he took some time to experiment with the idea anyways, and discovered that a Kingdom Hearts game set in 2D on less powerful hardware was possible while keeping the spirit of the original game intact. He was also more motivated when he heard that kids actually wanted a Kingdom Hearts game they could play on the go. And so the decision was made. Two Kingdom Hearts games entered production, with Chain of Memories set to be a title that would bridge the gap between Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2. Originally titled Kingdom Hearts Lost Memories, the name was quickly changed to Chain of Memories to reflect Nomura's ongoing development of the role of memories in the story. This would serve an additional tactic that would explain why Sora's skills were reset after the first game, with the explanation being that the memory loss he goes through hindered his abilities from the original Kingdom Hearts. In addition to the 2D movement and combat, Nomura implemented what was probably the most controversial mechanic still debated by diehard fans to this day the card combat system, as a way to represent Sora's memories and add depth to Kingdom Hearts hack and slash combat. It's not clear why a card system was chosen, but when you consider the ravenous popularity of the trading card games of the early 2000s, such as Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering, the decision makes a bit more sense. It's worth noting that the development of the card-based mechanics for Chain of Memories would be a big influence on another big Square Enix project, The World Ends With You. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories and Kingdom Hearts 2 were announced at the Tokyo Game Show in September of 2003, where initial details about the handheld game were unveiled, including the switch to 2D, the card mechanics, and the inclusion of fully animated FMVs, one of the few instances this was utilized on the GBA. To accomplish this, Nomura's team had to render the cutscenes using the graphics engine of the PS2 and encode them via a special technology process developed by Japanese company AM3 with the cutscenes actually performing pretty well in the final release of the game. Voice acting and music was limited due to the size limitations of GBA cartridges, so a lot of songs from KH1 were reused in Chain of Memories, and simpler tunes were composed for the areas of Castle Oblivion. Spoken voice lines were rarely used except in the most important of scenes. Chain of Memories was released on November 11, 2004 in Japan and December 7, 2004 in North America to generally positive reviews, with criticism being aimed specifically at the implementation of the card-based battle system and room synthesis mechanics. The art style and cutscenes specifically received excellent praise, highlighting the unique look of Chain of Memories pixel artwork. 
By 2009, Chain of Memories had sold over 1.55 million units, and between 2000 and 2006, it was the 24th highest selling game on the Game Boy Advance, sitting just behind notable GBA titles Golden Sun, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, and Metroid Fusion. Now normally, this would be the end of the story, but there's one additional chapter in the story of Chain of Memories. The game was remade a few years later into a fully playable 3D game on the PlayStation 2. In Japan, fans of the series got updated versions of the game called Final Mixes that included additional cutscenes, story, bosses, enemies, and gameplay content that wasn't present in the original releases of the game. For the upcoming Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix Plus in Japan, Square Enix's fifth product development team based out of Osaka created Kingdom Hearts Re-Chain of Memories, a complete 3D reimagining of Chain of Memories in the style of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, with card mechanics intact. All former text-based cutscenes in Castle Oblivion were now fully voice acted, and combat and exploration now took place in a 3D space. It was released bundled with Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix Plus on March 29, 2007, and as a standalone title in North America on December 2, 2008 on the PlayStation 2, two years after the launch of the PlayStation 3. This would be the version of the game that would be included in the HD collections that were released in the mid-2010s, and the version of the game that new fans of the series would experience going forward. So now that we have that little bit of history about the development of the game out of the way, let's touch on, like I said, the, probably the most unique and controversial thing in this game, which is the gameplay. And ultimately, we're talking about the combat mechanics. So hang on for this. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Everything in Chain of Memories, Rechain of Memories, has to do with cards, the worlds you visit, the way you progress through levels, and the combat. The worlds you visit are cards made from Sora's memory, so you do a lot of retreading, like I said earlier, the familiar worlds and story beats from KH1, and you get more world cards as you progress through the game. The way this works is that when you're going into a new level of Castle Oblivion, you hold up the card at the door and it generates a world based on Sora's memories. I know, a little bit crazy, but trust me, this is Kingdom Hearts. That's not nearly in the top 10 most crazy things that happen <laughs> when we get done with this. So each world is basically a series of interconnected square rooms that all link to each other. And there are doors between these rooms and you oh, each door has a card requirement to open it and to get these cards to open the doors, you get them from battle and the cards do different things. Red cards are enemy cards that influence the things your enemies do. Blue cards are things like Moogle rooms, save points, chest rooms where there are treasure chests, and then green cards affect you, the player. So let's say you play one of the cards, uh, you need to go into a room and has a card value of six. So you need to play a card value of six to get in there. So I'm gonna play one of the cards, it's called Tranquil Darkness. And what that means is that there aren't a lot of Heartless in the room when you open it up. So if you play your Tranquil Darkness card and open up the room you go in, there'll still be some Heartless in there, but not as many as just a standard base room would have. So the cards you play on the doors affect the type of room that you go into when you advance to the next room. You might think, hey, that's pretty cool. And the concept in Chain of Memories, this is called room synthesis, and it basically allows you to build a path through each level uh, according to how you want to play the game. You might think, hey, like that's pretty cool. And yeah, it's a pretty unique concept to allow the player to build their own path through the game and use the cards that they've collected to affect the outcomes of each room. That's that's a pretty cool idea. But in practice, by the time you get to halfway through the game, this kind of wears out its welcome. And if you start doing this thing where you're just playing cards to make a path that's easier for you through the game, you're going to punish yourself because some of the encounters later in the game are pretty challenging 
unless you're cheesing the combat, which we'll get to in a second. And so if you haven't leveled up enough to get uh, your card points high enough to build a sufficiently powerful deck and your hit points up enough to take sufficient amount of damage, you're going to be punished for that. So in a way, it's cool that the game lets you advance through the rooms the way you want. But in another way, if you abuse that too much, you're going to get punished. And basically by the halfway point of the game, there are no more surprises anymore. You've experience all the different type of rooms that you can do and it's basically a known quantity for basically the second half of the game which my playthrough was about 20 hours so by hour 10 you still have 10 more hours to go of something that you've already experienced and doesn't really change up much afterwards past that point combat basically works in a similar way so there are heartless in the room and when you run into a heartless it actually starts a battle there's a battle screen flash and you're actually taken to a, a battlefield so it's like a random encounter in final fantasy when it stops the game it takes you to a, a battlefield to basically have that battle that's what it does in kingdom hearts chain of memories you're basically taken to a separate screen to have that battle and the way you do that battle is basically through cards like i said every card does something in combat so as you're going through the game, you're assembling a deck of cards that allow you to do certain things. So you'll get Keyblade cards that have a picture of a Keyblade and a number on them, like 0 through 9. And those are your attack cards. Depending on the number that is attached to the card determines that card's priority. So, so let's say, for example, I'm fighting a Shadow Heartless, and the Shadow Heartless throws out a number 2 attack card, allowing it to attack. And I throw out a number seven card allowing me to attack because my card has the higher value. My attack is going to take precedence over the heartless's attack. And so that will what will occur is called a card break where you basically break their card and break their defenses and your attack will go through and allow you to damage them. And you can string together attacks like this from your deck, but your enemy can also break your attack. So if you throw out like a four or five card and your enemy throws out like a six or seven, then your card will be broken and that will leave you open to being attacked and being damaged. So you have to think about, you can't just throw your cards out and attack willy nilly because you could get caught off guard where the enemy breaks your card and you take damage unnecessarily. Magic cards work the same way. Blue cards are magic cards and there's fire spells, there's lightning spells, there's blizzard, the same thing. They all have different numbers on them to denote how powerful they are and what their priority is. And same thing for your items. Green cards are your items. So your potions, your hyper potions, elixirs, all that sort of stuff. The one exception to this rule is the zero card. The zero card is simultaneously the strongest and the weakest card in the entire game. So the way a zero card works is a zero card can break any card, but it can also be broken by any card. So let's say your opponent throws out a nine, the highest value single card it can throw out. You can throw out a zero and it'll cancel that card as long as you play it after the opponent played their nine. However, if you play a zero, an opponent can play any card and literally beat it. Zeros are very powerful in the fact that they can cancel out any attack if you're in a bind. So you mostly want to use them for that purpose because they can basically nullify any enemy attack. And that's very useful when you introduce the next concept, which you can combine cards in sets of three to make them more powerful to break and to set off triple action. So let's say you combine a seven, a five, and a three attack card. And now here I am doing math live on the air. That's a 15. So your overall attack will have 15 value to it. And will, like, so if you throw in three Keyblade cards, if they're Keyblade cards, it'll do three attacks in a row. And your opponent can't do anything unless they can break a 15 value. That's where the zero cards come in. So when enemies and opponents start playing these uh, triple sets of cards that make them more difficult to break, you can just literally whip out that zero and cancel their super powerful attack. What playing cards in sets of three does is sometimes you can activate more powerful moves called slights. And what that does, so that's like your Ars Arcanum, your Strike Raid, your limits, your stuff like that. The super powerful stuff you could do in the first game, that's what your slights are. So, And each slight has a specific card combination that is required to set it off. For example, one of my favorite slights that I use during the story of the game is called Sonic Blade. And so when you combine three different attack cards with a total of value between 21 and 23, that activates that slight Sonic Blade. This is where the strategy comes into constructing your deck is when you have a list of slights and when you have slights that you like to use or certain three card combos you like to use, you want to build your deck in such a way that will 
easily allow you to load those three card combos and pull them off because it's very, very powerful. It adds just a little bit of a layer of depth to the, the combat. The catch is, though, when you load three cards to do a slight, you lose the first card in your deck for the remainder of that battle. So, like, let's say if I put, like, a 9, a 6, and a 7 all in order to do my slight, and I execute my Sonic Blade, I'm losing that 9 card. So when I reload my deck when I run out of cards, that 9 card is removed. And, yes, you can run out of cards. When you go through the number of cards in your deck, you have to reload it, which is a moment you have to spend in the battle charging to reset all of your cards. But obviously not the ones that you put in your slight. Those are gone. The only way to get those back is by using items like an elixir that can restore all cards that you've used. When you get to the late game and you have a lot of cards to play with, you can potentially set up decks that you can just fire off these slights over and over and over again, and then reload your deck with an elixir and just do it over and over and over again. And that's where the game is completely broken. I said that my favorite slight was Sonic Blade for a good reason, because Sonic Blade, like a lot of the slights in this game, is completely broken. So what happens when I activate a three card set of 21 to 23 that activates Sonic Blade is, if you remember from the first game, it, Sonic was a move that Sora got from Cloud where he can dash back and forth six or seven times very quickly and deal a lot of damage. It's the same thing. So when you throw out that three card combo of 21 to 23 and activate Sonic Blade, what it does is Sora starts to dash back and forth with a triangle command input. And every time you hit that triangle command input is another dash onto that locked on enemy. And this is so powerful for two reasons. Number one, 21 to 23 value of a card set is very difficult to break unless you have zero cards, which a lot of the bosses do have. But when you're being hit by Sonic Blade, it stuns you and prevents you from playing any cards. So you can just load this attack over and over and over again and just stun your enemy into submission until you take out all of their life. And it's very, very, very cheap. By the end of the game, I had like a 50 card deck in which for like 40 of my cards were attack cards and I had them all lined up so that all I had to do was load them into my three card combo and just keep using them over and over and over again. And you're like, well, Eric, you said when you use the three card combos, you lose the first card of every three card combo. So wouldn't that effectively like cut your deck in a third after the first time? And you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. And yes, you would be right for sure. But like I said, elixirs give you all of your cards back. So if you stack a 50 card deck with the slights you like to use, and then just if you're fortunate enough to have like three or four like high value elixirs, it's game over. You can just keep doing that over and over again. And eventually you'll just do enough damage to the point where the enemy literally can't do anything. And Sonic Blade's not the only slight you can do this with. Final frame is one where it's like a stop card, an attack card, and something else. And that literally freezes time and allows Sora to get off like seven or eight hits. And then when time unfreezes, the hits take effect. And you can just do this over and over and over again. In concept, the combat is kind of cool. It's a unique idea to be able to tie your physical attacks to card values and then have the added layer of strategy to be able to like build a deck to pull off these powerful attacks and see how you can break the game. But on the other hand, it's super broken. And like I, it was a picture that I tweeted when I was halfway through the game. And I'm like, all right, I've built my Sonic deck and now it's the game's just going to be super cheap. And it was I after I built the Sonic deck, I, I tweeted the picture of my final screen, the end where it showed you your stats. And one of the stats it showed you was your most used uh, slights. And I use the Sonic Blade slight over 1500 times. Just how powerful it is. And like I said, that's not the only one. So uh, there's probably like 30 to 40 slights in the game just off the top of my head thinking of all the ones that I saw and I didn't even find the, the rare ones that require you to find like the secret rare treasure rooms. The idea is cool, but it's very flawed and very broken. And by the end of the game, it definitely wears out its welcome because you're just you're tired of it. You want to just button mash through to the end of the game, but you can't because the enemies at the end of the game are getting more powerful cards and you can't just button mash because they're just going to break your cards and then you're going to be screwed. Break and abuse the game by all means. And this specific break that I told you works specifically in the Rechain of Memories game. There are different slides on the GBA game that are extremely powerful. Any of the raids on the GBA game are super powerful. So like your fire raids or your your blizzard raids where you're where you're throwing the keyblade with an element attached to it. Very, very powerful. So just remember this. If you ever pick up this game, build a deck of slights and abuse the game because it is very, very, very powerful. 
the combat and gameplay do wear out their welcome, unfortunately, about halfway through the game. And it's it, I found myself, like I said, I my appreciation for the story and the lore and all that stuff in Chain of Memories definitely grew by my playthrough of this game. But my tolerance of the game's mechanics was already at its limit about halfway through. And I think that's the biggest weakness of this game for sure. It's a little less frustrating on the GBA version just because you're in a relatively small 2D space. When you're trying to do the same thing translated to the 3D space to match what Kingdom Hearts 1 was, it's a much more frustrating experience. And unfortunately, that's what most people are going to experience because the Rechain of Memories 3D remake is what's on the HD collections. So anybody that wants to play it is going to be playing that unless you're diehard set to get a Game Boy Advance cartridge, which I haven't looked. I don't know how rare those Game Boy Advance cartridges are. Now that we've covered the gameplay and how the basic gameplay works in Chain of Memories, we can move on to the main story beats and start dissecting the story of Chain of Memories. So if you remember where we last left off from Kingdom Hearts 1, all of our major players were pretty much scattered after the events when they defeated Ansem. They closed Riku and Mickey behind the door to darkness. They were sealed in there. The worlds reformed after they defeated Ansem, separating Sword Donald and Goofy from Kairi. Kairi returned to Destiny Islands, and a bunch of the worlds that had been consumed by the Heartless had been restored because... The end of the world was an amalgamation of all the hearts of worlds taken by the Heartless, by Ansem during the Heartless invasion. So everything kind of went back to more or less the way it was supposed to and everybody was separated. And if you remember in the ending cutscene for Kingdom Hearts 1, Sora, Donald and Goofy were walking down a winding dirt path through a verdant green field, uh, looking, trying to figure out what their next move would be to find Riku and King Mickey. That was their primary objective because because Kairi was back safe on the island. And at the end of that cutscene, Pluto appeared with a envelope in his mouth marked with King's seal and goes running off and our heroes go running off into the distance and the game closes out. I'm not going to touch on the secret movie that happened at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1 because that has to do with stuff that happened in Kingdom Hearts 2, so we're just not going to deal with that right now. We might not ever. I don't know. We'll see. This game picks up right where that story leaves off. Our heroes, Sora, Donald, and Goofy, are walking through a green field on a winding dirt path towards their next destination, following Pluto to wherever that may be. Some time passes, and it gets to be nighttime, and the trio, is they're laying in the grass field, just sleeping, getting some rest before they begin their adventures the next day, except for Sora, who shoots up and can't sleep and sees a man in a black hood, a long black road, a long black robe in a trench coat uh, with a hood that obscures his face as a zipper from the top to the bottom. This is a very, very standard Kingdom Hearts outfit that we will become very accustomed to over the next however many games in the series we have left to go. Along the road ahead lies something you need. However, in order to claim it, you must lose something that is dear to you. He kind of vanishes into the into the nighttime, into the distance. Sora follows and arrives at a massive, twisted, convoluted castle. And when I say massive, convoluted castle, uh, far, far off in the distance against a absolutely chaotic sky of swirling purples and blacks and all kinds of chaotic looking energies. This castle is an absolute mess. It looks like a seven year old's Lego castle with towers sticking out in every directions, uh, random towers built up in places, uh, pointed roofs that are skewed on one side. Uh, it is 
absolutely a mess what we are looking at here. The gang enters, despite the fact that it looks intimidating, Sora is convinced that the answers that they seek lie within this castle. So uh, the gang enters determined to find Riku and the king within. They don't really have any proof of this, but according to what the man in the black hood said, it appears that what they are looking for lies in this direction. So they turn to close the door and they see that the man in black is already standing there having closed it. Donald tries to attack him with magic, but to no avail, none of Donald's spells will go off. Why is it not working? I should think it's obvious. The moment you set foot in this castle, you forgot every spell and every ability you ever knew. In this place, to find is to lose, and to lose is to find. That is the way in Castle Oblivion. Castle Oblivion? I know this is a bit of a trope, and this kind of ties into the overarching theme of the castle, but we had to reset our heroes who are very powerful now. I mean, Ansem was basically an interdimensional being that they defeated. They had to reset their power back to a reasonable level so that you, the player, could have some sense of progression again. And I know this is the whole Metroid thing where Samus loses her armor pieces every time and has to get powered up every single time, but that's just the way it is. It's a different beast if you come from experiencing Final Fantasy where each story is its own detached thing. You don't have to really worry about that. Uh, in Kingdom Hearts, you have to because it's a continuous story. In addition to telling them that they've forgotten every spell and ability that they've ever known or learned on their adventure, he says that this is the nature of the castle. To find is to lose, and to lose is to find. That is the way in Castle Oblivion. As they continue to banter back and forth, the man tosses Sora what looks to be an innocent-looking card it's got a crown shape at the top and it just looks like a basic like your trading card or a playing card or something. What he says is that this is a card made from sampling Sora's memories and he tells Sora to hold it to the door to enter a whole new world where he will see uh, familiar faces. So Sora does just that because the man in black vanishes. He holds up the card and they enter the door and they find themselves they find themselves uh, in Traverse Town, the first world from Kingdom Hearts 1. And this is an important part, and I'm not going to go through every world in the story of Chain of Memories, because if you didn't guess by what the man in black said, is to find is to lose, to lose is to find, that is the way in Castle Oblivion. And from what he said about creating a card based on Sora's memories that created this world, or that showed him this world that he's currently visiting, the worlds in this game are based on Sora's memories. So we're going to be revisiting a lot of the worlds and story beats from Kingdom Hearts 1, although they're slightly different. I'm not going to rehash all those because to me, the plots in the worlds are really the B plot. And the way this game is structured is the whole game takes place in Castle Oblivion. Like I said at the top of the episode, it's really taking place in one spot, despite that you're visiting all these other Disney worlds. They're just memories. They're just Sora's memories. And really... The plot that takes place in these worlds is the B-plot. The spot where things really take place are the floors in between the different worlds, which are different floors, basically. So pretty much after you exit a world and are back in Castle Oblivion going to the next floor, that's where most of all of the story dialogue, the plot points get delivered. The Disney worlds really don't have anything to do here. A little bit they do here and there, and the themes of the stories of the worlds are a little bit different. Like for example, when they go into Wonderland, if you remember from Kingdom Hearts one, the whole story was that Sora, Donald and Goofy were trying to prove Alice's innocence because the queen of hearts accused her of stealing her heart. Well, it's a similar story beat this time, but this time they're accusing Alice of trying to steal the queen's memory. Obviously, as we go through this game, we'll be talking a lot about the themes of memories and things you think you remember and things you, th you know, that, you may have forgotten, but that doesn't mean that they didn't happen. So a lot of things about memories being connected to your heart, just so you guys understand. But what they do, just to cover one story beat in Traverse Town, they meet the memory of Leon and the gang from Kingdom Hearts 1. So Leon, Yuffie, Aerith, they don't have any memory of him or seem to remember who he is. But before and you go through the whole adventure, eventually they like make new memories, blah, blah, whatever. Before Sora and the gang leave Traverse Town, Aerith gives them a dire warning not to trust his memories as they may not be what they seem in Castle Oblivion. Not that she knows about Castle Oblivion, but just tells him to be wary of his memories. And I think this is an interesting point because it is true. Throughout time, 
as we get older, as we hang on to memories longer, the specific details of those memories become warped and distorted and we're not able to fully recall them, meaning that they're only a shadow of the truth that they once were. So interesting point by Aerith here. Interesting warning. Upon leaving Traverse Town, the man in the black coat's waiting for them afterwards and asks Sora if he enjoyed his experience walking down memory lane, uh, seeing his friends. And But before Sora can respond, another individual in a black coat arrives. Unlike the other man who has his hood up, this man has his hood down. He's sporting spiky red hair, bright as flames. He has bright turquoise eyes, and he introduces himself as Axel. Hello. <laughs> what do you want? No hog in the hero. Then perhaps you'd like to test him. Perhaps I would. My show now, Keyblade Master. Who am I? Oh, my name's Axel. Got it memorized? Uh, sure. Good. You're a quick learner. So, Sora, now that we're getting to know each other better... Don't you go off and die on me now. So obviously Sora fights Axel, and as I explained in the gameplay section at the top of the episode, all the fights take place in arenas in this card system and for the most part the card system isn't too unwieldy to use but in boss fights like these especially against these black hooded black coated figures these fights are are real challenges so you have to make sure that you have a good grasp on the card system to be able to succeed in these so after testing sora axel gives him more cards to access his memories so he gives you then after this you have like a choice of like five or six different worlds you can go to he also tells him that in order to find those closest to him and remember the memories he's forgotten, he would have to continue moving forward in the castle. But Axel also warns him that he might not be who he is anymore after he starts to remember, uh, seeming to imply that deep down in our hearts there are memories locked away that we don't remember and that the only path forward to remember those uh, is to remove the memories that are preventing them from surfacing. As they climb the next floor, and this is pretty standard what happens, it's kind of a structure of this game where there'll be like a boss fight, they'll climb up for, and Donald and Goofy and Sora will kind of stop and talk about what's going on and, and what's happened. What does all this mean? And Goofy says and starts to reference that Castle Oblivion reminds him of another castle that they explored together, and he tries to recall the name. It's Hollow, Holler, Holly something, but that he can't remember the name. And we as a player know that this was Hollow Bastion. It was one of the last levels in Kingdom Hearts 1. Sora and Donald find this a little strange, but they pretty much just brush it off and be like, oh, it's, you know, just being goofy or whatever. So after this, you can visit a couple of worlds in any order. You can visit Neverland, Agrabah, Olympus, Monstro. I think there were a couple others, but I didn't write them all down because, like I said, these things are relatively inconsequential. This is just the B plot. It's so you can have stuff to do in between the plot points. As they climb another floor, like Goofy's insistent that he remembers this castle, he, that he didn't just make it up. And citing the very specific moment where Sora stabbed himself to free Kyrie's heart. Sora remembers that moment, but he doesn't remember that it happened in a castle. So already we kind of start to see the effects of Castle Oblivion taking hold. And the warnings that Axel and our other black hooded stranger told us that in order to move forward, you're going to forget things and you might not be who you are. And to free the memories Deep in your heart, you might have to lose some. So we already kind of start to see like what the whole thing of Castle Oblivion in here and why it's called Castle Oblivion. And we're already starting to kind of tie together what's going on with all this. We're not quite sure where the black hooded, black coated individuals kind of play in this or what their what their end game is here. But they seem to know more about what's going on, about where Riku and the King are, about Sora's main objective than than they're letting on to settle all of this. To figure out what's actually going on, uh, if you remember, our pal Jiminy Cricket is also on the adventure with us, and he's been keeping the journal, and you can pause and look at the journal in Kingdom Hearts 1, so that's kind of that gimmick there, but he's been keeping his journal, so they ask Jiminy to look into his journal and settle once and for all if they were at a castle, if any of this stuff that they're like half-remembering actually did happen. 
And Jiminy goes to look in his journal and it's completely empty. There's nothing written down. And he's dismayed because he worked very hard on, on his journal. There's a lot of information in there from Kingdom Hearts 1. It's completely blank. Already we're starting to see Castle Oblivion taking memories, even written ones. Briefly after this, we see a cutscene of an all-white room and a blonde girl that we've never seen before in an all-white dress. And she's holding a drawing pad and she's drawing. She's drawing pictures. We actually did see this once before. It was right before Sora and his friends entered Castle Oblivion when they were following the man in the black coat. We saw just a glimpse of this blonde girl drawing. More mysteries to uncover. Sora and his friends decide to keep going despite the fact that something is not right here. They decide to keep going. One of the things they take heart in despite the fact that they choose to keep going is that they still remember what happened to Riku and the king and they still remember that that's the ultimate objective was why they're here. Despite the fact that they seem to be losing some memories or some fuzzy details about the things that happened, they remember their concrete goal and they remember the overall objective and that gives them heart, no pun intended, to keep going. And this is where we transition to a different cutscene. Most of the cutscenes, most of the story have been focused on Sora Donald and Goofy traversing the world, interacting with a couple of these figures in, in black coats. And this is where we get a different cutscene. We transition to a white room with what appears to be a crystal ball type thing in it, where they seem to be tracking Sora's progress. And we see Axel, the red haired man in the coat, interacting with a different person in a black coat. A short-haired blonde woman. They're standing at the crystal ball viewing Sora's progress. And in their talking, Axel reveals her name to be Larkseen. You seem pretty intrigued by this Sora kid. Are you telling me you're not Larkseen? <laughs> Haven't decided yet. I think what intrigues me more is what you see in him. There was a time he became a heartless. And if one becomes a heartless... They lose their minds and their feelings. They're consumed by the darkness. Right, but not Sora. He held on to his feelings even as a heartless. And there's only one other man who's been able to do just that. It's the strength of his heart. That's what interests you. Why the Keyblade shows Sora's heart. To unlock the mysteries of the heart. Isn't that the organization's mission? <laughs> Axel reveals a piece of information about maybe the supposed name of their group. He references the organization and comments on how their goal is to understand the mysteries of the heart. This being tied into the conversation they were just having about how Sora was able to maintain his memories and feelings as a heartless. And we get one slight little tell from Axel because Larkseen notices that Axel seems to be very interested in Sora. And when she asks him this, he gives the briefest of melancholy looks, uh, just a flash, a flash of a look that just seems off, that seems not Axel, that seem, from what we know of him so far. So the trio... Sora, Donald, and Goofy, they traverse another world, they go up another floor, they wonder if they've forgotten anything, and as proof that Sora is still maintaining his most important memories, he pulls out Kairi's good luck charm that she gave to him, saying that as long as he has this, it's impossible for him to forget, and if you remember, I don't know if I described Kairi's good luck charm from Kingdom Hearts 1, but it was a five-pointed star made from seashells uh, with a drawing of a face and some spiky hair on it, like it's supposed to be... Sora, I think, was the implication, and that's what it looked like. But when he pulls it out, it looks a little bit different. It, it's actually a yellow star. It looks more like the Paupu fruit from the island. It's actually a yellow star. But he doesn't seem to notice this, and when he clutches it close, he closes his eyes to envision Kairi, but another girl appears in the darkness of his memory. A blonde girl in white. The blonde girl in white that we've seen in these cutscenes confused Sora asks if he knows this girl if he's ever seen her kind of out loud to himself but he brushes it off and the group decides to move on but Sora can't can't shake the feeling as they traverse another memory and ascend another floor Sora is distracted by the memory of this other girl he's desperately trying to remember her name he's swearing it's right on the right on the tip of his tongue and he's just standing 
in Castle Oblivion, just in the middle of, of a floor, just trying to trying to figure it out. Donald eventually shakes him out of it, says like, hey, we have to keep going. Our, the king and Riku are waiting for us. But before we exit out of the scene, we transition, we see another scene of the blonde girl in white sketching. And we get a picture of what she appears to be sketching. It's a picture of Sora, Riku, Kairi, and herself all holding hands. The trio is now four. And we're not sure what that means because this girl wasn't present during any of the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. As far as we know, as far as I covered, and you know for sure that if it was important, I would have dug into it and I would have covered it. She's drawing these pictures of the four of them, but she wasn't present. But she keeps showing up in Sora's memories, maybe indicating that she used to be around or she was around. Maybe this is the hidden, the deep, true memories in the heart that Axel spoke of, that now that Sora is forgetting things, he'll be able to to free his true memory. And sure enough, as they climb the stairs to the next floor, Sora stops and says he remembers her. He remembers the girl from his memories, that she was on that she was on the island with him, Riku, and Kairi, but that she left when she was very, very little. And he seems to be remembering more and more about this blonde girl the more he progresses through the castle. And Goofy tells him to not worry that he'll remember it soon. And sure enough, again, hammering home this thing is that you know something's not, at this point, you know something is up. You've gone through enough of the game. You know things are weird enough that's happened. You know that things are not right. And you're desperately pleading out to Sora in the game. It's like, no, this is not, whatever's happening here is not right. And sure enough, to lose is to find. To find is to lose. The warning of the man in the black coat. As they continue to progress, Donald and Goofy continue to ask and pry about this new mystery girl, seeing if they can trigger more of Sora's memories. And Sora slowly continues to remember bits and pieces about how she was always drawing while they were at the beach. Uh, they were, she was drawing Sora and Riku when they, when they played, when they were sword fighting. But one day she just left and she was gone. And Sora didn't understand at that age, when they were very little. And he said that the grown-ups probably explained it to him, but he didn't understand. But he still, he still, still, still can't remember her name. That's the one thing that eludes him is the name of this person. But Jiminy notes that Sora keeps remembering things instead of forgetting them. And he posits that maybe the only way to get to the buried memories that he's remembering is by forgetting. Again, Jiminy finally connecting the dots between what was said at the start of the game and to what is happening to them. After this, we return to the members of the organization, Axel and Larxene, who seem really intrigued with the progress that Sora is making, genuinely impressed with his strength of will, his strength of character, and his strength with the Keyblade, and surprised that he would be willing to sacrifice so many of his memories to, to keep going. Larxene is tired of sitting on the sidelines. She wants to turn to test Sora because we have to have conflict, we have to have boss fights, right? We've gone a couple of floors, a couple of memories without any kind of significant organization boss fight. It's time for another one. There are boss fights in the memory worlds, by the way, themed around the Disney bosses that we fought before. You fought Genie Jafar again. You fought the Trickster from Wonderland. So those are all familiar bosses. It's But these organization fights are the ones that are really, really interesting. So Larxene goes to test Sora. Axel warns her not to break him and that Sora is the key to helping them take over the organization. That is what Axel says to Larxene. Larxene pauses for a moment, but seems to understand and tells Axel to keep that under wraps until the time is right. So there seems to be something going on here, a plot involving Sora and these members of the organization, and Axel stating what that intended goal is, is to help them take over the organization. So Larxene goes to teleport to meet Sora. She walks into a corridor of darkness. She leaves. Axel, grinning, says to himself that it's not him that should have kept it under wraps, but her. And in this scene, the way Axel seems to say it to Larxene is that he was kind of taking a guess at the motives of the man in the black coat who Larxene and he seem to be aligned with. And Larxene is initially surprised that Axel deduced that this is what was going on, but she immediately believes that Axel is in on whatever this plot is. So she tells him, hey, it's not time for that yet. Just keep it under wraps. And here we kind of have this dual narrative emerging. We're learning more about this 
shadowy, mysterious organization, and that not all appears to be right within their ranks. And we're not entirely sure how many of them there are because we keep meeting more of them. So there's this subplot of trying to take over whatever this organization is for their own goals that seems to involve Axel Lark seen in this other coded man that we don't know, haven't seen his face yet. And then somehow Sora is involved with that, but Sora, Donald, and Goofy are on their own separate journey to try and save Riku and King Mickey. So after progressing through another world of memories, the gang emerges onto the next floor, and of course, as to be expected, who should be waiting for them than Larxene? And Larxene just begins taunting Sora, accusing him, asking him how he could possibly forget that poor girl's name, and that her heart will be absolutely broken when she hears that Sora doesn't remember her. And Sora's really caught off guard by this because he's slowly starting to remember this girl. And then he comes to a terrifying realization and that this girl that he's remembering is, is here in the castle. And Larcine continues to taunt him. Larcine tells Sora that since he's the hero, it's his responsibility to save her, but that she's the bad guy and he, she's not going to let him just rescue her. Sora goes to rush with a keyblade and she just delivers a pretty firm kick straight to the, the chest, the sternum of a 15 year old boy. And Sora goes flying and Sora. What's that? Is that thing mine? What a shame. You've been wearing it all this time and forgot. No, that's not possible. The memory has to be engraved somewhere deep inside your heart. Sora, you think carefully now. What, oh what, could it be? And who gave it to you? Na... Na... Me. Sora, Sora! You're getting it now! Release the memory from within your heart! Name. Namine. Well, it's about time. That's right, Namine. Yes, she's the one that gave you that tacky little good luck charm. Not that you even bothered to remember. No surprise, seeing as you also couldn't remember her name. <laughs> Talk about heartless, I can't believe you. It'd serve you right if I decided to smash this piece of junk. Let it go! Nominate gave me this. It's very important to me. Oh, it's important to you. Ten seconds ago, you didn't even know what it was. Clarity strikes. A name comes to him. Namine. And Larxene is very pleased that he's remembered this name. And he says, yes, that's the girl. That's the blonde girl we've been seeing. Her name is Namine. That's the one that Sora is trying to remember. It was her who gave Sora the good luck charm. And of course, we're suspicious of the organization's intent here. Because we know that there was... No nominee in the first game, as far as we can remember, and that it was in fact Kyrie that gave the good luck charm to Sora. So at this point, we're as frustrated with Larxene as Sora is, and she takes the good luck charm, she threatens to smash it, and that goads Sora into attacking Larxene. It viciously, like very aggressively attacks Larxene, which isn't a normal character trait for Sora. I mean, he's very fierce when defending his friends and defending his friend's honor, but almost aggressively attacks Larxene. It's not something that we normally see from him. This brief battle, Larxene's a tough boss. She's her element that she controls is lightning. And I should have said that too. So when you fought Axel, he had these two like fire wheel chakra things or not chakra, chakram things, which are like the circular sharp things that you can like throw. And Larxene has like these um, brass knuckles that have spikes on them and they're yellow and she uses a uh, lightning. So it appears that all the members of this organization have a different element associated with them. You know, you can you beat her and Larxene leaves. She gives Sora more cards made from his memories. 
And after she leaves, we see Sora again in a light that we haven't seen him very much so far in this series. He's physically flustered. He's yelling, screaming out for Larxene to come back and face him as he's just swinging the Keyblade at nothing but, but thin air. Very unusual to see our boy Sora flustered like this so far in the series. And I think it's one of the few points in the series we actually see him so flustered. But Larxene returns to Axel. And Larxene comments about how she's so tired from throwing the battle. Axel's like, you didn't throw the battle. You just, you straight up lost. And it's at this point that another black-coated individual arrives, teleports into the room, comes through the spherical portal of darkness, which are called corridors of darkness. It's how the organization moves around. Not the, not the hooded man that we haven't seen, but a taller man in a black coat who has long, sandy blonde hair. And we discover that this individual's name is Vaxen. So that brings the no number of organization members up to four. Make sure you keep track of all these people because they're really important. Vexen comes in and he's kind of skeptical at this game that Larxene and Axel are playing. He's not convinced that Sora is worth the value that the two have, have placed on him. So he seems skeptical about Sora's actual abilities and what he's able to do. So he's come along and he wants to help and he posits that he wants to run an experiment to test Sora truly as if fighting Axel and Larxene isn't enough of a, uh, of a test. But Larxene just like kind of teases him and saying that he's not really interested in what's going on here. He just wants to test out his, his new toy to which we see a mysterious pair of familiar dark looking boots as the scene pans out. And we won't have to wait long to find out who this individual is. Well, you got to kind of wait long because you do memory floors it levels in between the beats of story. So obviously after this happens, you're going to do another level another part of the game before you find out what this is but because i am skipping past that and delivering the important parts of the story we're going to get that resolution here pretty quickly so as they emerge on the other side of that memory world as they climb another floor and progress through another memory he sees approaching him incredibly the owner of the dark boots that we just saw wearing his full dark getup from kingdom hearts one it's his friend riku No, you're Riku. What are you doing here? Not happy to see me? Let me know if I'm getting in the way. You know, of something that's more important. Huh? I didn't mean that. <laughs> Spare the excuses. I bet that you had all but forgotten about me. Are you crazy? Come on! I came all this way looking for you! But you're not anymore, right? Now it's only... Naminé that you're looking for. You don't care about me, just like you never cared. At all. About her feelings. Naminé's? <laughs> I knew it. Never even gave it a thought, did you? Just cause you wanna see Naminé. Sorry. Doesn't go both ways. Tell you the truth, Naminé doesn't even want to look at your face. Why not? You should ask your memories. Why Naminé disappeared from the islands. Remember that, and you'd know. Did I... Did I do something? Is it my fault? Riku... Go home, Sora. I'll care for Naminé. Anyone who goes near her... ...goes through me! What's... what's wrong with you? We're supposed to be friends! Please, Sora. Since when have you ever cared about me? Naminé's not the only one who's sick of looking at you. So am I! Riku, stop it! Here, Riku starts to... We saw him at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1 and we thought that he was very repentant about what he did because he was willing to sacrifice himself and lock himself inside the, the realm of darkness. But Riku's back to kind of his old bullshit here. He's taunting Sora. He says, Naminé doesn't want to see your face. 
And it has to do with why Namine had to disappear from the islands, basically putting the blame for why she had to leave on Sora. And it's here, as I'm reading my notes, that Riku becomes the 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 dark version of himself in his purple and dark blue with the heartless emblem uh, armor that he wore in the first game. He he tells Sora to go home and that he's going to be the one to protect Namine and Riku attacks. And here we have a fight with Riku at the next floor of Castle Oblivion. Like I said, it's an arena, it's a card battle. The Riku fights are as challenging as the organization fights. Uh, he's very fast, he's very powerful. He'll line up three chain combo attacks uh, pretty quickly. So make sure you have zero cards ready. Make sure you're you're on point with your dodging. And don't be greedy, be patient. Take opportunities when you're able to perform card breaks and when you're able to, to throw out some card combos. After defeating Riku... Riku's kind of surprised and he looks upset and he just he just runs off and Sora gives chase to the next floor. But to no avail, like Riku is is gone and Sora's very, very upset at this. He's this is not the reunion that he was expecting to have with his friend after how things ended in the first game and after seeing him again and upset that Riku basically lays at his feet the reason why Namine had to leave the island when they were younger, basically blaming him for it. And this leads Donald and Goofy and Sora to wonder if Ansem could possibly be controlling Riku again. If that's possible, then the king might also be in danger because the king was with Riku last time we saw him. And it's at this point that Jiminy is really noticing that things are starting to get out of control here. He thinks that Castle Oblivion is affecting Riku's memories similarly to how they're affecting everybody else's memories. And so that gives them a little bit of hope that if they can figure out and stop whatever's going on here in Castle Oblivion, that Riku will be able to get his memories back, Sora will be able to get his memories back, and that everything will kind of be sorted out. With Goofy leaving the scene, reminding Sora of the promise they first made when they were all together that they still remember, and that was to always smile, to never frown. So obviously now, since we got more memory cards, haha, memory cards from Larxene, we're able to proceed through more floors, uh, with the cards we got from Larkseen, we're able to explore Neverland, Hollow Bastion, and the 100 Acre Wood. Ugh, why they have to shoehorn the 100 Acre Wood into every single game? Oh my god, I can't, I can't do it. So we go a couple of floors, we explore these floors, and we get to a floor where, where Vexen appears before him. The sandy, long-haired individual that we encountered in the previous cutscene with Axel and Larkseen. And he challenges Sora, he claims that he's here to collect Sora's debt for reuniting him with his former friend claiming that he's the one that brought Riku back to him. And this makes Sora very, very angry. On the one hand, yes, he is happy that his friend is back, but immediately the accusation that Sora makes is that Vexen is controlling Riku. He charges and he clashes with Vexen in, in another pretty tough organization fight. And Vexen's whole thing is the weapon he carries is a, is a giant spiky shield that covers most of his body. And the element that he uses is, is ice. And if you're not on your game here, he can use card combos to, to freeze you in place and pull off some pretty nasty combos that'll kill you pretty quick. After the fight concludes, uh, Vexen kind of stops the fight. All these organization fights stop before anybody like dies or gets hurt because they're just testing Sora here. Vexen claims that during the fight, he sampled Sora's memories and that he made another card so he could experience another memory but this card was a little bit different it was from a memory locked on the other side of Sora's heart he claims a memory locked on the other side of his heart well what what does that necessarily mean we're not quite sure and Donald and Goofy are just as confused as Sora so Vexen takes his leave we return to the room with Lark, Seen, and Axel who is joined by another coded individual bringing the total number to five and this is finally the reveal. This was the gentleman that was talking to us at the start of the game, who was the hooded, black-coated figure that warned us about Castle Oblivion and originally set us on this journey first. A long, flowing pink hair. This gentleman's name is Marluxia. Axel seems very alarmed at what Vexen was trying to do in this encounter with Sora. In Context of the card that Vexen gave to Sora, claiming it was from the other side of his heart. He quickly tells Marluxia that if they lose Sora, that would mess up the organization's plans. So it seems that Marluxia, Larxene, and Axel are together on whatever this kind of plan is going on. 
Marluxia agrees. He claims that Vexen has committed treason against the organization and commands Axel to eliminate Vexen. So obviously, whatever plan Axel, Larxene, and Marluxia have, Vexen seems to be opposed. And we do learn a little bit throughout the story of this game is the organization is a group of individuals that are working together towards some kind of common goal. But there's a lot of politics of the inner workings of the organization where certain members have individual goals and collective members have a collective goals that aren't necessarily running parallel with they're running counter to what the goals of the organization are. And it seems that Vexen's goals are not aligned with Marluxia, Larxene and Axel's goals. And we come to find out as we learn more about Vexen too, that uh, Vexen has a very deep mistrust of, of Marluxia. So, and I'm kind of giving you guys that future information because just so you can understand where these battle lines are kind of drawn in this inner organization turmoil for whatever is going on here. So we go back to Sora. He uses the card that was given to him by Vexen to access another one of his memories. And the door opens and the light flashes. And this time he finds himself in a town. A brand new world. Not one that he remembers from his memories. A place called Twilight Town. A place that Sora is positive he has never been to before. But he dwells on what Vexen told him about this memory and how this memory is from the other side of his heart. And naturally, the way the game has been going and the way that Sora, Donald, and Goofy have been kind of figuring things out, they immediately think that this must be a town that they have forgotten in their memories. But before they can move in and explore the town, just as they arrive and they take a few steps, Sora remembers another memory with Namine on the island. A night when there was a meteor shower and Namine was afraid and Sora made a promise to Namine that that time to always protect her and that he would hit the meteors away with his toy sword if he had to. And this promise kind of becomes the catalyst and the motivation for Sora going forward for the rest of the game because he remembered this specific promise that he made. And even though it was during a meteor shower, he swore to always protect her. So they traverse through Twilight Town, trying to figure out what they're doing here. Sora and the gang find themselves in front of an old mansion in the middle of the woods. And this is where Vexen appears again. He emerges from a dark portal to confront Sora. And he starts to question Sora about the memories that he's been having. And asking him what, which of his memories are more real. His memories of Twilight Town or his memories of, of Namine. Vexen tells Sora that... This memory he's having is really a true memory, and it really is from the other side of his heart. But Sora refuses to believe it, thinking it's just another trick, and telling Vexen that his memory of Namine, that's the true memory. So we seem to have arrived at a crux here where Vexen is telling Sora that the memories he's having of Namine are not 100% true, but telling him that this world that he sees right now this is real and it is from the opposite side of his heart, whatever that means. And Vexen is incredulous at this point. He can't believe what he's hearing. He's accusing Sora of letting his heart be bound by a false chain of memories, that he's become a prisoner to this false chain of memories. Roll credits, title of the game. There we go. And here again, we see Sora act out of anger that he, he becomes furious and it seems that whenever these things happen around his memories of Namine, or he's pressured about his memories of Namine, he gets really flustered and really upset. He becomes furious, and he swears that he'll defeat Vexen here and now to save Riku and Namine. They clash once more. You fight outside of the mansion, and Sora defeats Vexen and has him at his mercy, dealing a significant blow to injure and weaken him. He tells Vexen to put Riku back. Vexen fires back and says, I'm not going to do that. He's telling Sora that Riku's destiny is to sink into the darkness. And Sora will too if he allows the false memories to imprison his heart. He will become Marluxia's pawn. You have such strength, even at the mercy of your memory. None of that matters. Just put Riku back. <laughs> Just put him back. The Riku you speak of has but one fate to sink into the darkness, and you will share that fate, Sora. 
If you continue to seek the girl Namine, the shackles will tighten. You'll lose your heart and end up becoming Marluxia's pawn! Marluxia? What does Namine have to do with... Ugh. Uh, Axel! Yo, Sora. Did I catch you at a bad time? <laughs> Axel, why? I came to stop you from talking too much. By eliminating your existence. No! Don't do it! We are just nobodies who have no one to be, yet we still are. But now you can be nothing instead of just being a nobody. You're off the hook. No! Please don't! I don't want to- Goodbye. What are you? What are you people? Don't know. I wonder about that myself. At this point, Axel says goodbye and incinerates Vexen with a snap of his fingers, and Vexen bursts into flames and is no more. One of the more violent deaths in the Kingdom Hearts universe, if I do say so myself, but you're probably wondering what's going on here. So it appears that Vexen has let Sora know that Marluxia is manipulating him into doing what he wants by using these false memories of this girl, Namine, to motivate him further into the castle. Axel and Marluxia don't like how much Vexen is letting Sora know because Vexen appears like he's trying to thwart whatever Marluxia's plan is. So Axel goes to eliminate him and he says that they are nobodies in that sentence. And when you read the, when you read the dialogue... On the screen, if you didn't have closed captioning on, which closed captioning is on, all, all the cutscenes are captioned. In the caption of that scene, when Axel says they are nobodies who have no one to be, yet still are, the word nobody is capitalized. And again, when he says Vexen can just be nothing instead of nobody, the nothing is not capitalized, but the word nobody is again capitalized. Now, if you know... From my Kingdom Hearts Primer video, you know the significance of why nobody is is capitalized, but we're not going to touch on that here. It'll tie into something that we learn in Kingdom Hearts too. Sora's st stunned. He's doesn't know what's going on. The the, the black coated people are fighting each other, killing each other. Sora asks Axel what the hell is going on and who the hell they are, and Axel just responds that he has no idea either and just takes his leave. He returns to Marluxia and Larxene. And he asks them that if Marluxia was just using Vexen to test Sora, and Larxene reveals to Axel that they were just using Vexen to test him, to see if they had what it takes to take out a fellow organization member. And now, they felt that they could trust him completely and bring him into their plot to take over the organization. That's what this whole thing is about. This is why they are manipulating Sora. This is why they had Axel take out Vexen. All this... To take over the organization. And Axel starts to connect the dots here. He understands now that's where Sora comes in. Because the wielder of the Keyblade has immense power. And in the organization's goal to understand hearts, whatever it may be, they could use Sora when they take over. Because the Keyblade is obviously in the center and, and is connected to this whole Kingdom Hearts hearts thing. So they obviously see Sora as a valuable asset that they're trying to get leverage over and control. And for the first time, we see Marluxia address Namine, who is sitting in the corner, saying that her reunion with her hero is close at hand. And he tells her to keep layering Sora's memories to bring him closer to her. So it appears that whatever is happening here on this plot it appears to be centered around Nominee and Marluxia is using her to manipulate Sora to his own ends and the plot starts to come out now. Upon exiting Twilight Town, Sora finds that Riku is once again waiting for him and Riku tells Sora to stop that he'll hurt Nominee if he goes any further and 
that Riku made a promise to her to protect her from anything, including Sora. And remember the story that Sora recounted a few minutes ago about the meteors? Riku recounts the exact same story. And this is where the boys start to fight. They they both start to fight claiming that the other person wasn't there because that's their memory. Sora pulls out his good luck charm that Namine gave him as proof. But Riku, after getting a brief headache, or a slight moment where he has like a flash in his head and he stumbles, a brief headache, he laughs almost maniacally and he pulls out the same good luck charm saying that Sora's must be fake. So each boy appears to have a good luck charm from their longtime friend Namine. Of course, we have another confrontation here with Riku. More difficult than the first one, Riku's move pool and card pool expands. But we defeat him, and Riku, run, Riku runs away, dropping his good luck charm, which becomes another card from Sora's memory. And this time, the picture on the card is of his home, Destiny Islands. But before they can proceed any further, Donald stops the group and is just wondering what is going on here. He's He's lost for words. He claims that... It can't be possible for two people to have the same memory referencing what Riku was saying to Sora and how they appeared to have the same exact memory. Sora becomes really upset at this, saying that they don't have time to sit here and discuss this in a committee, basically, and that Donald is accusing him of lying. And Goofy kind of calls him out here. He asks Sora why he's kind of being a dick and that since they've gotten to the castle, all that Sora can talk about is, is Namine. While before, while they were approaching the castle, he didn't even remember her. So Goofy, erring on the side of caution for an incredible amount of wisdom for a person who does not appear to possess much, says that they just need to slow down a little bit and just be more cautious in their approach because Goofy senses a trap. And we see Sora snap here and he tells Donald and Goofy that if he doesn't need them. He runs off without them with his sole focus. He has tunnel vision. His sole focus is rescuing Namine. And it is here that the roles are almost reversed because in the first game, Donald and Goofy briefly leave Sora. And in this game, Sora runs off without them. We shift back to the room where Axel, Marluxia, Larxene, and Namine all were. Except for now, Axel and Namine are in there alone. Marluxia and Larxene don't seem to be around. You're all that he's got left. So then, if you don't stop this, no one will. But I... It's too late. You shouldn't give up just yet. Say, Namine, have you noticed Marluxia doesn't seem to be around? What are you saying? Just that there's no one here who would want to get in your way. <laughs> Just make it count. As she leaves and closes the door, he laughs. And he gets caught off guard by this, saying that he's actually enjoying this. Which is strange, because if you remember his comment he made about them being nobody, when we get to Kingdom Hearts 2, this comment will make a lot more sense. Cut back to Sora, who's just about to enter the door and experience his memories on Destiny Island, and Jiminy's still with him, and Jiminy's trying to talk some sense into Sora that that was no way for him to treat his friends, but at this point, Sora is beyond reason, and he snaps at Jiminy, too. We don't usually see Sora like this in the in the brief one game experience that we've spent time with him. And going forward in the series, we don't really see him act this way again. So it's, it's very obvious that Sora is not in his right mind and that his tunnel vision focus on rescuing Namine is so, so intense that he doesn't care what he says or how he treats other people. He wants to rescue her at all costs. Sora finds himself on Destiny Island and he, he meets with all of his old friends and he, he relives the memory of, of his home's destruction as we see in Kingdom Hearts 1. But again, he, he doesn't care about any of this. He has a singular focus, find and protect Namine. You have a dark side, heartless boss, just like you did in Kingdom Hearts 1 when Destiny Island is being destroyed. And at the end of that, 
Namine appears before him on the island. Finally, he's, he seems to finally have found her. Sora is overjoyed to see her, and Namine expresses that she wants to see him too, but that this wasn't the way. Uh, and then she explains to him that she lured him into the castle, and that in order to do that, she had to meddle, meddle with his heart. Just then we hear another Namine call out from behind him, her voice from behind him, and she appears in his memory as an apparition, a ghost, transparent. She tells Sora that she isn't in this picture. She isn't meant to be there on Destiny Islands with him. And she doesn't exist in his heart at all. Sora can't believe this. He says that I've been looking for you. I made a promise to protect you. Sora even pulls out the good luck charm that Namine supposedly gave him as proof. And she tells him it isn't real. And begs Sora for just a moment to close his eyes and to hold the good luck charm and think for a moment. Who is really most important to him? And as he thinks, the good luck charm transforms from the bright yellow star that we've seen into the familiar good luck charm given to him by another, by Kairi, a person that he hasn't thought about since he remembered Namine. When this happens, Sora rushes out of the memory and catches up with Namine on the next floor. Sora asks her, begs her, what is going on? And Namine tells him that the girl he always thinks of in his memories, it's, it's not her, it's Kairi. And Sora is finally about to get the answers he's been looking for. Sora asks, why can't he remember Kairi? And why is he remembering Namine? But before Namine can reveal the truth, Riku appears once again and tells Sora that he can't remember because his memory is a train wreck and that he was meant to protect Namine. The boys, and we'll talk about in just a second why this happens after I finish laying out the scene. The boys fight, and just as Sora seems about to win, Riku blasts him with dark fire. Like, Riku's ready to straight up murder Sora. Before Riku can rush up and, and finish him off, Namine screams at him to stop at the top of her lungs, and this causes a bright flash of light, and Riku drops to the ground, limp, not moving. As Sora cries out for his friend, Larxene appears and she's laughing maniacally and she says that and she says that Namine basically smashed Riku's heart and then tells Sora not to worry because Riku isn't really there at all. She tells him that the Riku lying there isn't the real thing. It was just a puppet created by Vexen's experiments. A Riku replica, if you would. It couldn't remember anything because it had no memories to remember. Just the ones Namine planted in his mind about protecting her. And Larxene tosses the Riku replica to the side like a lifeless doll. And it is here that Larxene goes on to explain Namine's powers. You're so stupid. Don't you get it now? That's what Namine's powers are about. She can enter, rearrange, and even create new memories of anything, even things that never happened. The girl you've been trying to protect all this time is really a manipulative witch who shackles people's hearts. Uh, then my memories are all... Oh, you do get it. Lies, lies, all lies. Just nominees, illusions, nothing more. Binding you in the chains of your own memory was central to our trap. It makes me tingle to think how easily you were duped. So close to it, we were almost there. This was our only chance to turn the Keyblade Master into our puppet, but that jerk Axel, he used Nominate to betray us. <sighs> so now, I'm left with no choice but to eliminate you. You'll pay. All of his memories of Namine are lies planted there by her. Part of their plot to bind him in a chain of memories and manipulate him as a tool for the organization. And this has been the point the whole time. They have been removing, rearranging Sora's memories to make him to the point where he's so obsessed with Namine that as long as they control Namine, he will do whatever they want to get her back and protect her. Eventually to the point where Sora wouldn't even remember who he is or what his purpose is, and that they would have control over him fully. 
here again we have this saying that Sora is bound in a, a chain of memories. He was a he is a prisoner of these fake memories that aren't even his. And I think this is an interesting point that the story keeps making over and over again that the memories we have of friends, of family, of loved ones are powerful. And there's something too at the start of the game in Wonderland that the Cheshire Cat says about the nature of memories that even if a memory is not real, if you believe something that is false long enough and hard enough, then that memory to you becomes a true, real memory. And because Sora believes in his heart so strongly because Namine has meddled with his memory that he is meant to protect her, well, there you go. Sora rises to his feet and says, it doesn't matter that the memories are fake. The promise he made is still real, and he is going to keep it. And just before the fight begins, Donald and Goofy catch up, saying they made a promise to Sora as well, and they won't let him fight alone. So Donald, Goofy, and Sora confront Larxene. And after a grueling fight, one of the toughest fights, and Larxene's one of my favorite organization members because she is a absolute monster and the only female member of the organization so far. After the fight, they defeat Larxene, and she fades away in shock. She can't believe that she was defeated, and she just fades away disintegrating into, into darkness. After the fight, the gang gathers around Namine, and after a moment, she explains everything to them. She corroborates Larxene's story. She explains how she took the people and memories in Sora's heart and replaced them with lies, memories of her and a promise to protect her, and that she was never there in his true memories. It was all part of manipulating him so that Marluxia could gain control and gain leverage and gain the upper hand against him. And Namine says she went along with it because she didn't have any choice and she'd been alone for so long. Namine says that if they go to the 13th floor, they can fix everything. But Marluxia stands in the way. And if they want to get Sora's memories back to the way that they need to be, Marluxia has to be removed from the picture, basically. And she goes on to explain that Marluxia threatened to keep her locked up in the castle. She didn't do what he said and she's already been there for, for so, so long. So obviously Namine's suffering heavy mental trauma at the hands of Marluxia and the organization to get her to go along with with hurting Sora. And Sora has kind of dialed it back now, now that he's met Namine and now that he knows everything that's going on. And Sora says that he understands that she manipulated him, but he he can't be mad at her. And he will refuses to be mad at her. And she ultimately she was in trouble and he wants to help her. He knows that his memories of her are false memories, but he still insists on keeping his promise that he made to her in his heart. Even though it wasn't a real memory, he insists that it's still a promise and he intends to keep it. He asks Nominate to look after the Riku replica while they go deal with Marluxia, and all that remains is to navigate the 13th floor of Castle Oblivion. We switch scenes, and as Sora and friends are navigating the, th the, the 13th floor trying to get to Marluxia, we switch scenes and see Marluxia in a room where Axel appears to confront him You have some nerve to show your treasonous face around here. Some nerve indeed. Treasonous? I don't know what you could possibly be talking about. Why let Namine go? If it weren't for your needless meddling, we could have turned the Keyblade Master to come and serve us. Oh, right, your big plan. You use Namine to rewrite Sora's memory piece by little piece. And he turns into her total puppet. Then, using Namine and Sora together, you and Larxene overthrow the organization. Am I right? I would say that you are the traitor, Marluxia. Since when were you suspicious of us? Do either one of us have the heart to believe anyone? <laughs> so you only eliminated Vexen to obtain proof of our plan. That I didn't want to do, but it was your order. Oh. Remember the order. You must eliminate the traitor. I always follow orders, Marluxia. After this, Axel and Marluxia clash with one another, Axel wielding his 
flaming chakrams that he throws and whirls around in a dance of elegance. Merluxia wielding a wicked, devastating looking pink and green scythe. It appears from the flower petals that he holds in his hand. Very dramatic, Marluxia. He's very, very dramatic. So they clash with one another, but at a lull in the battle, Marluxia somehow teleports Nominate to his side, having grabbed her from where she was in Castle Oblivion. He uses her as a shield, Axel telling him that it won't do any good at the same time that Sora and his friends arrive in the room. Marluxia tries to manipulate Sora, saying that Axel wants to hurt Nominate. So here we see like the manipulation Marluxia, despite his plan having failed, trying to use Sora and his false memories of Nominate to eliminate somebody that's standing in his way. So it's clear that Sora's getting ready to fight Axel. He's determined to defeat Axel and Marluxia and the entire organization. Axel says one thing before they start fighting. And he says that they have more in common than Sora realizes and he would rather not fight. But he would not dishonor the organization. So Axel is probably the most interesting character in this game because he says a lot of things and alludes to a lot of things that haven't happened or we don't know what exactly he's referencing yet. But when you look back, like when I finish the Kingdom Hearts 2 episode and you go back and look at a lot of the stuff that Axel has said, you'll realize why it's so important. Little throwaway things or little comments he makes here and there really do tell a lot about his character and what his motivations are and why he says the things that he does. So they ultimately fight Sora defeats Axel and Axel seems fine with this and he congratulates Sora and he says to himself that it was worth saving Sora after all. And Sora asks him to elaborate, but before Axel can give any answers, he says he doesn't want to ruin the suspense before disappearing into the darkness. So of course we have to go to kingdom hearts two to find out what happened. Sora Donald and Goofy rush upstairs to confront Marluxia, who seems very pleased that Sora has essentially removed Axel from the board out of his way. And Marluxia just goes on about how he was trying to manipulate Sora and he wanted to, to make the Keyblade's power his own. And he commands Nominate to just erase Sora's memory, just wipe it completely clean, saying that it will essentially destroy his heart, given that memories are a chain inside the heart, a little linked together, but that he would be able to rebuild Sora in time to someone more compliant. Nominate refuses and stating that Sora had forgiven her for what she did, even though she deceived him and she's not going to hurt Sora, but Sora who desires the preservation and protection of Nominate above all else because of the memories planted in his mind tells her to go ahead and do it. He doesn't care that if his heart's destroyed, that he will protect her no matter what. And he doesn't need his memories to confront Marluxia which is kind of a badass thing because he was just like, yo, I don't care if I basically don't remember anything. Like, I will still whoop your ass, which is kind of badass if you think about it. Marluxia tells him that he'll be an empty, unfeeling shell, just like the Riku replica. And then we hear the voice of Riku replica. Take another guess. <laughs> what? Ah! It can't be. Riku! No. Just an imitation. Uh, you're a shell. A shell who has had everything taken. Everything! What can you possibly think I ever had? Both my body and my heart are fake. But there is one memory I'll keep, even if it's just a lie. Whether it was a phantom promise or not, I will. Protect Nominee! Imbeciles. You would knowingly shackle your heart with a chain of memories born of lies? You would be one who has a heart, yet cast aside your heart's freedom? You turn from the truth because your heart is weak. You will never defeat me! So we finally arrived, just like we did arrive at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1. The final confrontation. It is finally time to confront Marluxia.
In typical Kingdom Hearts fashion, in a epic three-part boss fight, the first fighting him uh, in a room outside of the room where he normally hides, and just him by himself with his scythe. And then they defeat him and he disappears, but they know that he isn't gone. And I believe it's Nominee that tells that tells them that that was basically an illusion. The real Marluxia was hiding behind the door in front of them. They steal themselves for one last fight, one last showdown. So Sora asks the Riku replica to protect Namine when they when they confront Marluxia. This is a big moment because Sora has been very selfish and very defensive of Namine. But now that he knows the truth, even though he's fought with Riku replica, he knows that their best chance at winning and her being safe is that Riku replica fulfills his promise to protect Namine while he confronts Marluxia. So they open the door to confront Marluxia and you have two more boss fights with Marluxia here. One is he has some kind of insane giant white creature with with scythe hands that he's riding on top uh, that he goes all over the stage and you have to defeat him in that form. And then in, in his final form, uh, he's standing at the far end of an oval arena, an oval shaped arena. And behind him towering over is a giant white creature holding a wicked looking scythe basically an avatar of Marluxia and this fight's absolutely brutal particularly because uh, Marluxia has a move that he can do where if he hits you with his scythe it will knock all the cards out of your deck all over the arena and you basically have to put your deck back together before you can attack again but uh, this boss fight not quite as epic as the Ansem fight from Kingdom Hearts 1 but I do think that this fight's genuinely underrated in the series because we don't get like Marluxia gets taken off the board pretty early here in, in Chain of Memories. And he has a really, really awesome boss theme called Lord of the Castle that I think is is really underrated in the series because it doesn't get used that much. But they ultimately defeat Marluxia and they rush out of the room and Sora uses his keyblade to lock the door that Marluxia is behind. Things appear to be wrapping up here and they ultimately have one last conversation with Riku Replica before he walks off. You okay, Riku? Not Riku. I'm a fake. I can't remember why I was created or where or when. All that's inside of me is time with you and Namine. But I know those memories are not real. Gee, Namine, can't you use your magic to put Riku's memory back to normal? Well, I... It's all right. I'll deal. Wait! Who cares if someone created you? You are you and nobody else. You have your own heart inside you. Those feelings and memories are yours and yours alone. They're special. Sora, you're a good guy. I don't have to be real to see how real your feelings are. That's good enough. Riku! So now they're sitting here, they're wondering what to do. They're, they're wondering about leaving. Uh, Nominee tells them that she can put all their memories back the way they were. And that her power was misunderstood by Marluxia and Larxene. She doesn't erase people's memories, but she explains that people's memories are like a chain and each one interlinks with one another. So all she does is she undo undoes the chain of memories. She can link them back together. She can move them around and stuff. So she said all she did was undo the chain and insert new links in there. So she says that she can retrieve the memories that she unlinked and link them back together in their original states. But if she undoes the links of the memories that she put inside Sora and restores his original memories, he won't remember his time in Castle Oblivion and he won't remember Namine. Obviously, Sora not wanting to forget his new friend, but after a long pause, Sora realizes that he needs his old memories back to keep his other promises he made to his actual friends. He chooses to regain his old memories and forget Namine. At this point, Namine takes the trio into a room filled with large egg-shaped pods. She explains that she'll have to put them in these pods and put them to sleep in order to restore their memories. It'll take a while for her to do this, and the best way for her to do that is to put them in stasis, basically. And she's going to restore their memories, and they realize that once they go into the pods, this is the last time they'll see her, this is the last time they'll remember her. 
how will they remember that this is what happened? And Jiminy has a great idea to put a note in his journal to remind them. And he puts a note that consists of only two words. Thank Naminé. Before Sora enters the pod, he and Naminé have one last conversation where they express gratitude at having met one another. And Sora makes a promise that even if he doesn't initially remember her, he'll come find Naminé and thank her so that they can actually be friends for real and start making some some real memories. All of this may have started with a lie, but I really am glad that I can meet you, Sora. Yeah, me too. When I finally found you, and even when I remembered your name, I was happy. The way I felt then, that was no lie. Goodbye. No, not goodbye. When I wake up, I'll find you. And then there will be no lies. We're gonna be friends for real. Promise me, Naminé. You're going to forget making that promise. If the chain of memories comes apart, the links will still be there, right? So the memory of our promise will always be inside me somewhere. I'm sure of it. Yeah, you're right. Okay, it's a promise. Good. Until later. shadows of your heart and I won't be able to find them but don't worry you made another promise to someone who you could never replace she is your light the light within the darkness remember her and all the memories lost in the shadows of your heart will come into the light another promise Look at the good luck charm. I changed its shape when I changed your memory. But when you thought of her just once, it went back to the way it was. As the pod closes, Sora takes one last look at the good luck charm of the girl he should remember. And as the pod closes and Sora closes his eyes, Sora sees her. Sora sees Kairi. Before we leave, and that is the last scene with our hero Sora, for a chain of memories. But before we leave, there is one last scene. A white circular room ringed with 13 thrones of varying heights, some occupied by figures in black cloaks. And as the scene fades to black, we focus on one figure in particular, a black cloaked individual who is sitting on the highest throne, taller than all the others. And he stares into us for a few seconds before the scene slowly fades out. And we go to credits. And during the credits, the game ends with a poem. There's always sleep between part and meat, with our usual words on the usual street. So let us part like we always do, and in a world without you, I'll dream of you. When I come to, let us meet, with our usual words on the usual street. But our story doesn't end here. There are two sides to every coin, a front and back cover to every book. There's always another side, another story.
Thank you.